Welcome to the Swim Swam podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. I'm joined by Swim Swam Editor-in-Chief Braden Keith, and we have two very special guests today, Danielle Obe and Ed Acura. My name is Ed Akira and I'm the producer of the um, film documentary, a film called Black Can Swim. I'm also co-founder of the Black Swimming Association, the BSA. Hey, well, I'm Danielle Obe. I am the inventor of the NMS, a recreational aquatic headgear, alternative to the standard swim cap, and I am the interim CEO and co-founder of the Black Swimming Association in the UK. All right, so so let's get right into it. Uh, we're, he, we're we're talking about a film called Blacks Can Swim. Um, Ed, can you give us a little background on on how this film came to be? Okay, well, where do I start? Um, okay, it started when I was nine years old, and I asked my mom because I was I was brought up in Ghana. I went to Ghana when I was seven, and I was asked, and, and it's so funny because I was um, I was in an international school. So in my school in Ghana, there was only about two or three black people in my class. So, so, so weird. Um, well, and there were people from all over the world, um, Australia, India, the US. And there was one guy in my class who had a pool in his house. Well, many of them had pools. But what one guy in particular, he had a party and I said to him, um, he was invited to the party. So I asked my mom, can I, I don't know how to swim. Can you teach me how to swim? Can I have lessons? And what I recall my mum saying was, um, you don't need to learn how to swim. Uh, it's not important. We don't have a pool in our house. Um, we don't live near the sea. So what you need to do is study um, um, your English, your maths. That's what you need to um, spend time doing, not learning how to swim. And so I never learned how to swim and um, carried on. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure at some point in my life, I. I began to, um, um, I listened to the stereotypes, but basically the stereotypes, the stigmas, and I was hiding behind the stereotypes and the stigmas. And at some point, I, I actually believed that these were true. I couldn't swim because I was black. And so I just carried on. And what changed it, there's a number of things that changed. The first one was, in 2018, I went on holiday with my family, my wife, my daughter, and a few friends, probably about 12 of us, went to Barbados. And as you may know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a musician as well, so I make music. And there was a series I did, a, a, a jazz series called Noise, whereby it's just instrumental music. And I initiated the project by saying that I'm only gonna do three albums, but, People kept on saying, oh, you should do another one. Really like it. It's very chilled, laid back kind of vibe. So I said, okay, I'm going to do a fourth, a fourth one. So when we went to Barbados, I took my laptop with me and my keyboard with the intention of making, uh, starting the production of the fourth album. And of course, I don't drink because I'm such a good boy. And uh, I was like, I can't swim. I said to myself, when everybody's in the pool and I'm bored and people are drinking, I'll just go back to the hotel and I'll start the production. So two days into the holiday, took the laptop out, and it would not power on. And I did everything, changed the power supply, changed the adapter, everything. And it was a, re a reasonably new laptop, but it would not power on. So I said, OK. Um, I just put it aside. And around about the same time, a friend of mine said, OK, why don't we all go on a boat trip? So usually, because I've been to Barbados before, and when there people go on a boat trip, I don't, because I can't swim and have no interest in water. So I'll stay back in the hotel and just do what, just chill out. But because I had no laptop, I said, now well, I'll just go, go on the boat trip then. So we went on the boat trip. And as soon as we got onto the boat, um, they gave us a life jacket. So everybody had a life jacket for a while, then they, everyone took it off. Last people started getting comfortable. But I kept mine on. Then one of my friends, um, Safina, she said, let me take a picture of you in your life jacket because you look so cool. Could you have one of your album covers? And I said to myself, okay, but why would I use an album cover of a life jacket, me in the life jacket, and let's record the song 
is something to do with swimming. So straight away came to my mind that was um, the film White Man Can't Jump. And so I said, somebody needs to do a song about black people not swimming. So then I started writing it, make a film called Blacks Can't Swim, soundtrack in a new jack swing, cast a lead in the floating ring. Is it a cultural or physical thing? So basically, I finished on the line, is it a cultural or physical thing? Because that was the, the, the thing that stood out to me. You know, because people say we can't swim because of um, our heavy bones and all of that. But is it really a physical thing or is it a cultural thing? So finish with, we yeah, enjoyed the boat ride. Everybody was snorkeling, doing their thing, jumping in, diving in. And I was sitting like a lemon on the boat by myself. Um, <laughs> so came back to the hotel and guess what? I put on the laptop and it powered on first time. <laughs> it was almost as if it was a sign. So I recorded the song, read the, did the, um, what do you call it, the vocal, the rest of the, the verse, the chorus and everything. And holiday over, came back to came back to the UK, and um, put the song out. I said, "Look, well, I just put it out on um, YouTube on iTunes, and just kind of forgot about it." But about two or three weeks later, I get a, um, a message from someone called Alex Fair from Swimming Nature, and he's like, "I want to teach you how to swim." And um, we've heard your song, and we heard what you're talking about in your song, and. I want to teach, we want to teach you how to swim. So if you're anything like me, lived in London most of my life, um, if anybody offers you anything for free, you were like, What's, what does this person want? And, they, and that's what they said, they're going to teach me how to swim for free. I say, okay, what's the catch? Uh, they said, well, basically we understand the issue with a, a disproportionate amount of black people not swimming. And we want to teach you how to swim and prove that it is not a physical thing, it is a cultural thing. So I said, okay, fair enough. Um, around about the same time, another friend of mine said to me, why don't we make the film? And I was like, oh, hold on, make a film? I have no idea, I've never made a film before, I, mean, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. But then I said, hold on, I've made music videos, and I know a good director who does most of my music videos. So I called him and I said, Mr. X, I want to make a film. Then he, then he started asking me a whole heap of silly questions that only a film director would ask, like, what kind of grade is it? What kind of, do you want it to be a short film or a feature film? I said, listen, I don't want, I just want to make a film. And so, we, so, so after that, we sat down, we, we talked about how the film would look, and it was like, I came up with the idea that there's a lot of people I know that can't swim, and, and most of them are black. So why don't we just get them all together and we just ask questions and we just talk about it, have a discussion. So, it, so after discussing it, it became that we set five questions and we just interview people based on these questions and see what happens. So we did it. And then, then I said, hold on, so how long is this film gonna be? And it goes about 10, 15 minutes. I said, 15 minutes? What kind of film is that? I want, it, I want an hour and a half, an hour at least, 40 minutes, 30 minutes. And he says, well, we can't have half an hour of just people, unknown people, not names, unknown people talking. No one, people are just going to get bored. No one's going to be interested in that. But however, if there was a drama story behind it, then it might work. So I thought, okay, fair enough. So I thought about a story about me coming downstairs, because it was shot in my mom's house. So me coming downstairs, um, um, look at watching the television, look at the television and seeing a news report about flooding. Then all of a sudden my acrophobia kicks in. Never had it before, but all of a sudden this acrophobia kicks in and I'm panicking. What am I gonna do if it's flooding? I can't swim. Then I have this bright idea, because I'm such a genius. Go buy a life jacket and wear it everywhere I go. In the bathroom, in the bed everywhere <laughs> so so i went and bought a life jacket and i put it on and that's where everywhere i go so that was the plan so then i was discussing it with, um, with mr rex and he said that i said we need something else there's something missing then we came up with the idea of mr society talking and telling me that the stereotypes you know reciting the stereotypes you can't swim you're black just wear this the, the, just wear the life jacket wherever you go you'll be okay you don't need to swim that kind of thing. 
And at the same time, at the other end is my, my friends and family telling me that you do, you can swim, everyone can swim. It's not an issue, you all just have to learn. So I'm stuck between these two forces, my friends and my family. And um, on the other hand, the uh, what do you call it, Mr. Society telling me that I can't, I can't swim. Then obviously at the end of it, I make a, just have to make a decision on what I'm gonna do. Um, so that's basically how the film came about. So I finished the film, brought it out as a, brought it and the, the trailer, trailer out. Trailer out, trailer, trailer was released just before Christmas on December 24th, uh, 2018. And I put it on Twitter, the two minute trailer, and it just went crazy. It went mad that people were like, wow, this is a great, this is awesome. I got messages from people, also I got no, I got messages from you guys from some, I got messages from everyone saying, okay, this is this is great, this is great. And I was like, wow, okay, this wasn't the plan. The plan was to just create a um, you know, film, just put it on, just put it on YouTube and just move on to the next next thing, next project. But the response was so great that I, I, I just had to do something about it. So that's when I thought of the, um, the campaign, the Blacks Can Swim campaign. Tell people that you can't swim. And at this time, I started lessons. So I had got over the, the, the aquaphobia and I was you know, making way in the water. So I was telling people that, yeah, look at me. Even someone like me who had never stepped in water before can is learning how to swim. Going back to the film, the last scene of the film with me getting into the water, I don't know if I should be saying this live, I don't know if it's gonna real um, what do you call it, ruin the, the 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 ending of the film. But basically, that was the first time I ever stepped into a pool, like properly into a, a swimming pool. So not only was I panicking and stressed because I'm producing a film, I've never produced a film before, so I have all this stress about producing a film. I also have to get into the water, <laughs> so it was, um, it was, it was, it, yeah, it was, a, it was a bit of a, uh, as I say, an adventure. So yeah, going back to the release. So basically, I released a trailer in, in December. It, it was just going crazy. Then. February, I decided to screen it. So we had a screening in London, and it was it was that was snowing on that day actually. And I had people from BBC Radio London had a few you know known faces come down to watch it, and the people's responses were like, "Yes, this is great. This is amazing. You need to you know you need to actually do something with this." And um, so I kept on doing a campaign on Twitter, you know, campaign and and and. and you guys must have seen, you know, every every few minutes, every few hours, you see something about Empire putting something about Black Council on Twitter, and I'm just on and on and on. And it got to a point where I said to myself, if I carry on doing this, I will people are going to get bored, bored of hearing my voice. So I need to try and find a new angle, and that's when I came up with In the Deep End, which is a, a podcast interviewing people from the black community about their personal life story with regards to swimming. And, and the, way I, the way I see it, everyone has a story in swimming. With, you know, when you're talking about swimming, swimming, everybody's got a story. If they can swim, how did they learn how to swim? What made them swim? What age did they learn how to swim? If they can't swim, why don't they swim? You know, what holds them back? What held them back and all that kind of thing? So to me, I believe that everybody has a story. And so I started interviewing people. I started speaking to people. The first person I interviewed was the actor Colin Salmon, um, been on James Bond and quite a few other films. He was the first person I interviewed. But and, and I interviewed Noel Clark and quite a few other people. The most one of the most interesting one was a gentleman um, by called um, DJ Semtex, and he's a radio DJ, and he's quite known within um, in the, the hip hop circles in the UK. And I can remember I was walking down, I took my daughter to school because I work from home. So I took my daughter to school in the morning and I came back and I saw a message from DJ Semtex saying, I want, on Twitter saying, I, I want you to interview, contact me, I want you to interview me on, on the, in, in the deep end. And I was like, is this somebody just having a laugh? And I'm gonna look and I look for the yeah, 80,000 followers, blue tick, yes, it's him. <laughs> so I contacted him 
and I said, um, he goes, yeah, I want you to, I want you to interview me now today. And I go, uh, can we do it to, tomorrow? And he goes, no, I really need you to interview me today. So I said, okay, give me 15, 20 minutes. Let me just go set up my stuff at home, go set up the equipment. So I did. Then I interviewed him. And he said, the reason why, so basically, I was, and before, before the interview, I actually went on Google, I went on, and I checked and Wikipedia, DJ Semtex. And I found out that he had a condition. Because he asked me, prior to that, he asked me, are you aware of my condition? And I said, yeah, of course I am. I've heard about, yeah. And I was on Google checking what's actually doing. <laughs> um, yeah. So and he goes, yes, it's a good thing you know, because I didn't want to embarrass you by saying it's on, on, on the interview and you not know what I'm talking about. So I found out that he had one of his arms amputated due to a swimming incident. Um, an infection, he had an infection, he didn't treat it. And I think he had a condition anyway, but as a result of him swimming and not drying himself properly, he, um, he had his arm amputated. And apparently he never talks about it. And he says on Wikipedia that he never speaks about it, but he wanted to speak about it with me. So I said, okay, I'm on it. And he said the reason why he put so much pressure on me to do the interview then and there was that if he had time to think about it, he probably wouldn't do it. So it was a great interview. Um, so yeah, so I interviewed him, a number of other people. And one of the other people I interviewed was a lady by the name of Alice Deary. So I interviewed her, we got on very well. Then we, and then we were talking about what we are doing, what I'm campaigning, what my campaign's doing, and what she is doing. Because she was doing exactly pretty much the same thing as what I'm doing, but she's doing it from the elite level. And I was kind of doing it from the grassroots level. So, and around about the same time, there was another lady who was interviewing Alice about a, um, something to do with her hair for the BBC, and the Sarah and Jones. So Alice introduced me to Sarah, and, and then we started talking. Saying that we should do something together. Yeah, so you know, the, 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 the three of us doing a great thing together um, uh, individually. We should do something together. So we just talked about it, but nothing ever happened. And you know, was that thing? It was about October, November, October. I, I no, it was October actually. I got a message from Sarah saying, "I want to meet up with you. I want to meet up with you. I've met a lady by the name of Daniel Obey." She's amazing. She's amazing, and she's she's got the same. She's almost got the same drive of us. She was lying about the amazing part of it. Um, <laughs> so she goes, "Yeah, I want to meet up with you. Let's meet up, and so we can have a conversation." Um, so I asked myself, "Okay, two beautiful ladies asking me to meet up. I'm not going to say no to that, am I?" Um, <laughs> so we met up, and the rest. Is history, basically the rest is history. Um, I'll leave where we left, where we met, where, where we moved, went on from there. I'll leave Danielle to say it because she says it so well. So basically, that's how a film called Last Time Swim came out to be. So, so Danielle, let's let, let's uh, put the ball in your court. How did you first hear about Ed um, about the, about the movie and what piqued your interest to want to meet him? Ed probably doesn't know this. I came across his story and his movie before I got to meet him. And I even requested on his website to have uh, a trial to watch the film called a film called Black Town Swim. I just thought it was a really good play on words. I think at that time I had just come up with an MS and I was thinking about what I do and where I go from there. I was speaking to Swim England and I had spoken to Severin Jones, but that was about it. So incidentally, I, I watched the film and I thought it was it was really, really apt because it resonated with a lot of things that I had had to live and a lot that I knew was within my immediate community and my family. So I kind of thought to myself, I'd really like to meet this person someday and maybe do some work with him and see how we can come together in synergy to amplify the voice and, and really showcase and highlight this particular issue that we have within our community. Um, so it wasn't until I read Ali, um, Alice Deering, sorry, Seren's report on Alice Deering, where she she quotes, um, and I and I requote, I, I understand why girls will quit because of my, of their hair. I didn't get the article myself, so my husband came across the article on the BBC, knowing what I'd been working on with the issues I had with my hair, my daughter sent me the link and said, read this link, 
contacts from England and maybe write to this journalist and let her know what it is you've been working on. So that was really my connection to speaking to Seren and Seren introducing me to Ed. So yes, I had watched the movie at the time and I thought it was fascinating because there really isn't anything that the movie has left out. It is, it is one of those things, it's an icebreaker. We all know that there's an issue. We can see that there's an issue, but it's been the, the, the case of there's an elephant in the room. How do we start talking about this elephant? And so this movie is just that. It is highlighting these significant issues that preclude us as a community from engaging in aquatics. Now, the, 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 the thought about it is whether or not one agrees with these, whether they're true or they're limiting beliefs or they're just stereotypes society has put on us, I guess is, is not really what is in play at play right now, but the education and the, um, and the talking about the issue is the only way we'll get to, high, to highlight these and resolve them. So the BSA really was formed off the back of four individual projects within our community that came together to amplify and stand as a voice, um, as a strategic partner, as a change agent, and as an advocate to change the narratives where Black, Asian, and minority ethnics in aquatics were concerned in the UK, and as we see it now, global. And so since starting the BSA, how have, how have the two of you seen it ripple throughout the community? It's, it's, been, it's, it's been incredible. You go, yeah. you go, Ed. Yeah, it's, 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 been, it's been really, really good. It's like, um, it's, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of, um, well, and, and, I, and I'll go back to before I started, um, um, before I, I, when I was doing the research to, um, to create the film, I was doing a little research on, on, on Google to find out what organizations are there within the UK that talk about the issue with a disproportionate amount of black swimming. And there were a number of articles here and there. There were a few there, but there was no, there was no continuity. There was nothing consistent. And so when I did the, um, when I recorded the film and we started the BSA, we wanted something that would be consistent, uh, an organization uh, that would continue with the issue and try and get people, you know, try and get people to understand the importance of water safety, drowning prevention, and swimming as a whole. And the whole aquatic thing is there's because there's nothing really there out there that was doing that. So when we were, when we when we launched the BSA in March, it seems like so long ago now. Like it was just in March. It was just in March. You know, a few, a couple, a few months ago, the response was amazing. Right. It was crazy. So it's it's been it's resonated within this community, especially here in the UK. I know that in the US you do have um, different states and you have different organizations that have been set up to deal with you know certain states and the issues that they have. Here in the UK, there isn't any one organization. Yes, we do have BAME teachers, we have BAME coaches, a few of them. Um, we don't really have that much BAME representation, BAME being Black, Asian, minority, ethnic representation in elite aquatics. Hence the reason why we, we get to hear a lot of Alice's voice because you don't have a lot of Alice's. Now with setting up the BSA, what we have come to, a few things we've come to find out in this journey is that at at school level and at club level, especially county clubs and nationals, there are quite a significant number of young black swimmers and Asian swimmers as well. But for some reason that doesn't filter off into the elite part where you have nationals and you know uh, Europe or the Olympics. And one of the reasons for that, well, there are a few reasons. One of them is the lack of education within the community as to the actual benefits of aquatics and a career in aquatics. Um, you also have the stigma that we have of the fact that we don't swim. So as a mother, I know that I sit here and the assumption will be that Danielle can swim. Well, I can, I'm a traveler. I'd like to consider myself a traveler. I love snorkeling. We snorkel quite a lot as a family. Um, but when you snorkel, you snorkel with a life jacket. You're on top of the water. So you don't really need to be able to swim to snorkel. So again, I would say that I have um, consciously hidden behind the stereotypes. I actually love water and I really enjoyed swimming in my teens. But I had I got to the point where I had to choose between my career um, as you know a budding 
um, management consultant and, you know, and swimming. You don't, with my sort of hair, you don't go swimming last night and then you have a meeting today. You've got to find a hairdresser as a salon that washes out your hair and prepares your hair and primes your hair. So it's, it was a major thing, but it was quite tough for me as, as, as a person because swimming had gotten me through a lot of health issues when I was much younger as a teenager. I couldn't do anything else. I couldn't do any sport that put any strain on me, but swimming was, was, was my go-to. Hydrotherapy was my goods, but I had to find myself giving that up because I couldn't do otherwise. Uh, and a lot, there are a lot of Daniels in in within our community. A lot of Eds within our community. Um, and this is that time to almost hold your hands and say, "We hear you." Now, whether some of these issues are founded or not, we're bringing everything to the table. We're going to unpick this. We're going to find resolution to this, and we're going to get in there. So going back again to the juniors who who've got really great times and swim. But as a mother, if you don't know that there is a great career, if you don't, if you yourself have got aquaphobia and you don't place any value on swimming, you're most only, you're unlikely to encourage the child to go through. You're unlikely to, to get the child to carry on in elite aquatics. Again, it's perceived as being quite expensive. So there's a lot of education that has to happen within the community and there it begins with the parents and the children. And, and it's really from grass level up and elite down. So we're hoping the BSA will do just that. Here in the U.S., certainly, and I know there's, and a, and lot I know there's of, a lot of uh, protests, protests going, going on in the UK, UK over social justice, justice um, after, after, after the George Floyd killing. Can you guys speak how you view the Black Soy Association, Association and what you guys are trying to do and how that sort of fits into this bigger narrative that we're all seeing around the world really about, 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 about racial, racial equality, equality and social justice, justice and those sort of topics. Um, obviously, there's been, with the recent climate with the George Floyd's murder, um, there's been a, the uprising with the Black Lives Matter movement. And as a BSA, obviously, we did launch in March and, you know, with, with the pandemic, I wouldn't say things were on freeze, but it was really calm, it was quiet. We didn't really get to do a lot of things we would have had to do before. Fast forward, having the BLM issue, we found out that there's been, a, there's been a, a huge outcry. And these are things that we know from a systemic perspective within the UK, there's been gaps. So we talk about the fact that we as, as Blacks do not engage in and participate in aquatics, but that's because we don't really have inclusion we don't really have any measures set in place to push for diversity or participation for more of us um the, the way that the learn to swim programs are, are tailored here in the uk again are not necessarily tailored with with us in mind um they're not that inclusive so again with the bsa we found that we have national aquatic governing bodies who are contacting us now and they're saying well we hear you we know there's been an issue and now would like to stand side by side with you to make a change and make a change in fundamentally how we have run our programs, how we have put across the messaging, how we have um, not had the right signposting within your community. In essence, nothing has ever been done in the UK to address the aquatic issue and lack of in the BAME community. But with the Black Lives Matter movement, all of that has changed. And we find ourselves speaking to the CEO of the Royal Life Saving Society UK, um, to the, the CEO of Swim Wales, of, of Swim England, uh, they're now engaging with us. And so we're hoping that the platform of the BSA is one that, um, that, that, that starts to make those changes, that starts to realign the programs that are available, that starts to address that issue of our exclusion, whether intentionally or not, we have to address these issues. We have to have these uncomfortable discussions. And um, follow from there, stepping slightly out of um, aquatics, but looking at the ethnicity as a whole, I believe that this is the time, and not only for swimming, but for everything else and um, within the community, I think this is a time that there's a big red button that we have hit. We are hitting that button to reset. To reset and the things that have happened for years and years, generations, we can't change history. History cannot be changed. So I know in, in, in the US, there's an issue with um, swimming that goes back to in the 50s and the 60s when 
segregation was in place and, and same people were not allowed to use same pools because of their race and that kind of thing. And all of that, there's, um, it can even go back to slavery. Correct. You can go back to slavery whereby people were thrown overboard, pregnant women in the journeys from Africa to the Americas, women, uh, um, women were thrown overboard, men that were ill were thrown overboard because it was more beneficial to claim the insurance than to take, have a, 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 what do you call it, a pregnant woman or a sick person who you couldn't sell. It's, they had no market value. Commodity. So, yeah. So, that, so, yeah. So, there's a lot of things that happen which have, in some respects, affected um, the way we do things. Not only swimming, but a lot of other things. And we all, we all know what's happening in the world. We all know what's happening in the US with the police brutality. Um, what's happening in the UK with um, what you call um, institutionalized racism and, 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 and people's thinking. But I think this is a time to reset that button and start all over again. But in order to do that, people have to understand, people have to you know, understand where we are. And I think this is what's happening at the moment. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people, especially in the UK, um, it's very, very different from the US in, in certain ways because because it's not very, it's not, it's not visual. It's not always visual, so people can't really. see. Yeah, so people say, "Oh, no, yeah, of course, you, you, there's no racism here," because they can't see. It's not visual, very visual, but it's there. But so now people have to understand what's going on, and you know, come on, you know, let me play field. We set that button and start all over again. Rightfully so. So one of the responses we had to the BLM was to come up with a BSA charter. And in the charter, we were saying, these are five, these are seven things that we're going to do. We're going to have to find a way to understand these issues and resolve these issues within the community so that we can put certain things, certain, certain measures in place to make us more inclusive. And one of these, which is actually charter number four, number four in the charter, it says that we're going to, whoever is partnering with us, as in we make a commitment to showcase BAME specific aquatic products um within swim culture and make it more accessible and inclusive and we we're really talking about the likes of ed's film from an educational perspective having more modest wear because we are more curvy um having the light right headgear having you know walking into a club and seeing a a, a black or bay model in in speedos wear that's really where we were, we were going with all of this um really trying to make our products more inclusive within being culture now a lot of people signed, signed the petition. We had someone who wrote in to us and said, you know, he, he's happy to reach out to us and help out in the pool, but he cannot sign the charter in good faith because of point number four, because he doesn't believe in the efficacy or quality of BAME aquatic products, present or future. And he cannot in good faith also spread this among his friends, his colleagues and his family. And we stepped back and we thought that is the prejudice, the racial prejudice and bigotry that we have to go through. If you're trying to reach out to us and make a culture and make you know swim culture more accessible and, and inclusive for us, then we have to feel like we're part of this. How can you make the assumption because the products are vain, they are substandard? No, not necessarily. I mean, I have had, you know, products of known brands fail, you know, swim, swim hats ripping on me, you know, swim trunks not really keeping me in as I would like to be kept in. And I yet I don't walk away thinking this is substandard, this is subpar. So those have become the normal things within swim culture. And all of a sudden our products are future and present and future products will be substandard and subpar. That is, these are the sort of institutional issues that we're dealing with. Um, another thing that we're working on right now, and, and, I, and I digress, but I'll come back in, just really put it in context, is I'm here today because of what I developed. I developed what I developed to cater to an issue. I've been out of water for 18 years, and I didn't want to see that cycle. My mother doesn't get in. My sister doesn't get in. And I didn't want to see that cycle repeat with my two daughters. And so coming up with this product, I, the first thing I did was to go to the national party governing bodies and say to them, this is something that we can use within our community to reach out to swimmers. Would you like to consider it? Would you like to endorse it? Would you like to use it? And you know, fast forward months after, nothing has really been done about it. 
Because again, it's not necessarily an issue that is understood within the non-bank community. So it, it all goes back to that understanding. It all goes back to the intentional or unintentional prejudice that we have to go through on a systemic basis. So Ed, when you were conducting these interviews for the film, how did you tackle these these themes that you and Danielle just discussed? When I was, when I was um, writing the script for the film, it was loosely based around my journey, my story. So I looked at the things that I use this, the kind of stereotypes that I hid behind. Um, for instance, the heavy bones, one I hear it all the time. I've had friends who, who have gone swimming, who learned how to swim. I've got one in particular, he's in the film, a, um, Adrian. He learned how to swim and he was told by his instructor that the reason why you're not getting it or the reason why you're struggling is because you're heavy bones. Like, um, I've had, um, so, so basically there's a lot of stereotypes, there's a stereotype about and, and priorities. That's and I know that that's a huge one. Um, when I was learning, when I, when I was young, my mom said to me, um, "My mom's quite big on water safety. She's yeah, she's really really big on water safety. And her idea of water safety is stay away from the water and you will not drown. Um, you keep away from it and you'll be okay. And that's how she that's how she, and, and there's a lot of people." In the community that live like understand live that by you know, by those um, by those ideologies, stay away from the water and you will not drown. I mean, there's some kind of truth to it, but you cannot live your life like that. And so, yeah, so that's how. So when I when I decided to make the film and I was put together questions trying to understand what people, the reason why people didn't swim, that was made that was it was based on that, and people came up with their own reasons, and hair was one of them. And um, hair was a big one of them because a lot of black men spend a lot of time and a lot of money on their hair. And chlorine does not do anything great to the hair. So therefore, if you spend your, you spend about 150, 100 pounds, 60 pounds, whatever on hair, you and sit down, you're not going to, not going to be jumping, jumping the water with it. And the hair and the, and the swimming cups that were available were not adequate for black hair. Um, enter um daniel and hair product because that is purposely created for hair big hair afro hair all sorts of hair that need to be covered for the water and it's also moisturized it also moisturizes the hair as well so it, you know it's, it's doing a um, like I said, a double duty it's doing the keeping it dry and it's more keeping it moisturized so that i hope that answers the question um, and another thing if i could add to that um Braden and, and Coleman, what we've also discovered with the way, when you look at it from a systemic perspective, the way the Learn to Swim programs have been set up, they can't really tackle the issues that we deal with. So we're pushing to have a layer of dry swimming that happens outside of the pool, which is one of the things that Ed's film, a film called Blacks Can't Swim, is helping us achieve. We're starting to have those discussions. We're starting to have those uncomfortable discussions. We're starting to to show them something that they can relate with. When I mean they, as in the non-swimmers within the BAME community and also the swimmers within the non-BAME community. So there is now a talking point. There is a meeting point to then go forward um, because a lot within the non-BAME community are not aware and don't appreciate that these are actually significant issues that we have to deal with. So one of the things we also, we, we got a message that came through when we launched the BSA, and this is from a gentleman who, who probably wasn't about his 80s at the time, uh, who sent us a, a text saying, an email saying, you know, how can he help when he learned how to, to swim, well, become a swimming teacher back in the late, late 60s, early 70s. He was told that um, with us, we had big hips and big bones, and so we couldn't swim. And so whenever he had to teach one of us, someone, one of us came over to him and said, we wanted to learn how to swim. He will, he will push them towards athletics. He'll push them towards land and aquatic sports. And he was saying, that's what he was taught. And he was asking us a question, almost like rhetor rhetorically saying, he wonders how many people have believed all of that, that he spoke. So that's the way programs were designed back then and potentially still are the case right now so the understanding of these issues that are being highlighted by Ed's film um, is, is all brand new within our generation or within our time. But it's time to change the narrative and we have to start from somewhere. We need to start having these conversations. And that's exactly what the film does for us.
It brings everyone to the table and gets us talking. Depending on where you are in your personal swimming journey, are you still swimming? Are you doing laps? So courtesy of swimming nature, um, they're still teaching me how to swim. And the problem I was having was um, breathing. So I can do I can I can do a length as long as I can keep uh, underwater, as long as I can uh, what do you call it hold my breath. But when I come up to breathe, then it all goes to pot. So that was a big issue I had. But just before the uh, pandemic, I broke through it. So I managed to find and now we we managed me and my um, Mark truth my swimming instructor we managed to break through it so i managed to know I, 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 so at that point i could breathe i could swim and i could come up and i could breathe and i could go back down again but then uh, the, uh, the coronavirus came and therefore i haven't been swimming since then so i haven't been swimming since march so i'm hoping that when we go back i will actually be able to still remember and, and carry on so, so one my my personal journey um, with swimming, like I said, was was a pleasant one from day one. I was taught how to swim by my dad, and it was something that was actually a family bond. It, it brought us together. Um, my husband and I also enjoyed swimming and snorkeling. But again, my husband learned how to swim as as an adult. He is a he's a black male, um, and and these are these are stories that are familiar. So even staying out of the water, I didn't stay out of water for choice. I stayed out of water because I had to make a decision to choose my hair over my career. And obviously I went for the career option. Um, my next encounter with swimming uh, happened with having having children of my own and, and my, my daughter. And um, a particular issue that, that really sticks with me and that really was that turning point for me when I had to find a solution to the issue with hair and water. So it's not just the chlorine damage to our hair, it's actually water and chlorine damage. So with your standard Afro hair, you could brush it out and it's on about 12 or so inches. When you when you wet it or you get around water, it shrinks down to five inches. So it's, it's the styling and it's the care because just because of the nature of our hair. So it's not just the chlorine, it's just, it's water in general. Um, so so my, my, my light bulb moment or my aha came the day when I had been doing this over and over again, where, you know, we're going swimming, I take my daughter with me. It's a whole fight to get her out of the car and then get her into the water where you're priming her hair, putting her, uh, the, the, the caps on, she gets in her hair, the, the caps fail her, she comes out completely soaked in chlorine and I've got to wash that hair out. One of these days I'm doing the standard routine thing and she's screaming, mommy, no, mommy, no, no, mommy. Now we're in the family changing room of our local health club. The next thing, 15 minutes or so after that, I get a, a, a knock on the door and I'm thinking, who's that? I mean, I'm exasperated, exasperated thinking, you know, this child is just, I just need to do this. And how do I, how do I explain to a three, four year old that I've got to wash her hair out? The knock on the door and I'm like, who is that? And I'm, they're identifying themselves as, oh, someone has reported that a child is in distress in reception. Please open the door. What is going on? I open the door and it is the, um, the duty manager and the child care protection lead who have turned up at the changing room. I'm holding my daughter in one hand, trying to calm her down, shampoo in the other, standing there thinking, uh, who's reported what? And like, where's the child? I literally barged in, where is the child? Is the child safe? Is the child okay? And I'm thinking, what is going on? Oh, we've had a report that there's a child screaming, mommy, no, mommy, no, what are you doing to this child? And I thought, I'm, I'm trying to shampoo her hair. You know, we just finished the swimming lesson and her hair, the, the caps just, they've not kept her hair dry. Her hair's got chlorine in it. I've got to wash it out and prime it. She doesn't like soap. She doesn't like anything water around her face. That's why she's screaming. And you could have heard a pin drop. I have the stairs such uncomfortable stairs almost like we've heard it all we've heard of people abusing kids and now you're telling us when we could evidently hear a child crying on the other side of the door you're telling us she's crying because you're shampooing her hair after a swim i mean who does that it's almost like we'd heard it all and i stood there thinking i can't explain it to you you're two caucasian ladies with straight hair who go swimming come out rinse your hair out with pantene 
or whatever is available you know dry it out and you're good to go we our hair doesn't do that it's a big thing for me as a mother to have to deal with this over and over again i haven't done anything to my child i'm just trying to shampoo her hair and they just stood there and i could i was just i had the sicky feeling in my tummy where you're thinking they're going to call child services aren't they they're going to call child services on me and my saving grace really was when she calmed down my daughter i said no kayla please tell these lovely ladies why you're screaming and then she starts mommy no i don't want to shampoo my hair so they finally heard it from the horse's mouth but my saving grace on that day was one that was a, a health club that we attended two because my children were homeschooled we were seen at the club five six seven days a week sometimes so i had built a relationship with these with the ladies and when with the staff generally and again we're very very few of us um, people of color who attended this particular club. So my daughter, so the, the, the tennis teachers are Caucasian, they're badminton, karate, swimming, everyone. They've never ever seen you know, a BAME lifeguard or a BAME swim teacher. My daughter was, this middle child, she's incredible. She was one of those who said, mommy, why isn't my teacher's hair like mine? Mommy, why don't I see any people like me who are teachers or who are lifeguards? She asked me this at five. Now, how do you answer that question? because fundamentally it's off. And a five-year-old is already picking up on these, that the norm is to have a non-BAME swim teacher, is to have non-BAME lifeguards. So anyway, going back to the story of my in, of that incident on that day, my only saving grace, like I said, was because I had built that relationship and the club was, was a reputable club. Otherwise I could have lost my daughter or at least have a social service case opened because of this incident. Because it was, it was almost, they stood there unbelieving, thinking, no, that cannot be the reason why a child would be in so much distress. So again, these are things that are not understood, but they are lived and they're true. And in a way, I wouldn't say they're the prejudice intentionally, but that's the way the system's built. It's built to, I wouldn't say disadvantage us, but if you don't understand what we're going through, how can you talk about an inclusion? How can you talk about diversity? How, how can you change the system? Because it's not really built with us in mind. And that's what we're looking to change as the BSA. And that's exactly what Ed's film is doing. It's getting so much traction because people are listening. People are going, oh, oh, I see. So that is an issue. But why would that be an issue? It's okay to ask the questions, but at least acknowledge that there is a problem. Acknowledge that there is a need to, to, to address these particular issues within our community. There's, no, there's a number of times, um, almost on a weekly basis, where someone contacts me and says, why the BSA? Why, if we have a white swimming association, there will be uproar. How, how can you call it the BSA? And anytime someone says that to me, all I say, I don't even try and explain to them that the issue is that there's a disproportionate amount of us swimming and we have to pinpoint the issue by, you know, by isolate, we have to isolate the issue. But all I tell them is just watch the film. And as soon as they watch the film, they come back and say, I get it. I have not had a single person who come back and say, oh, you know, continue the argument. You go, yes, I get it. I understand. So um, that's what we're looking to continue. That, that's the importance of the film. It's acting as that, you know, icebreaker. Let's all get to the table and let's let's talk about this. And, and also what we're finding is that the people who are interacting with us, because the Black Singing Association is called the Black Singing Association, but we don't exclusively work with just the Black community. We work with the aquatic community as a whole. I mean, we're speaking with you today because we're not in there yet, but for you to make it inclusive for us, you have to understand and where were things that I was, was, a, was a big light bulb moment for me as the power of swimming and the power of sports was um, when, when the NMS broke through and you I had over 20 to 30, I'm not exaggerating now, over 20,000 people wrote in and these were Indians, these were Caucasians, these were Afro-Caribbeans, these were friends. And, and people just wrote from everywhere saying, Thank God for this. There's finally an alternative. I have uh, I have given up swimming because of my hair. Now I was shocked because I thought no, the issue was with our hair. I didn't know that every the issue was with everyone's hair. So Caucasian hair that has that's been treated with color and goes into chlorine will be changed, you know, or the color wouldn't last. I just didn't know. And there are also some ladies who have just got thick, long hair. Yes, silky hair, but thick, and that will not really fit within 
uh, in a swim cap, swim cap. So it, it was coming from everywhere. And so I kind of thought, actually, wait a minute. Um, it's, 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 it's a global issue. It's not just the BAME issue. Yes, the product may have been inspired by that, but it's a global issue in the same light as Ed's film is. It may have been inspired by, by our you know, culture, um, as in people of color, but right there, there are also Caucasians in you know, low socioeconomic areas who, who cannot swim, who also have issues, issues with aquaphobia and no one is talking about these things. So we're hoping that the dry swimming resources and the change we're looking to effect with the way um, swimming is delivered with that layer of dry swimming will, will, will be beneficial to, to everyone within the aquatic community. So long and short of it is this, there's nothing that that really brings us together as much as sports does. And swimming is a sport that we love, but it also is something that would change our lives because it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a crucial life-saving skill. One of the precipitators for launching the BSA when we did was the, the tragedy in Costa del Sol, where you had a, a black family who went out on holiday on Christmas Eve, a mother and her daughter stand there and watch the demise, the drowning of her, her nine-year-old daughter, her 52-year-old husband, and her 16-year-old son. A family of five go out to the pool because of the lack of water safety, per perhaps, or you know, it could have been you know, swimming. We, we don't know what it is, but somehow we lost three out of five of a family of five um, within our community. And we just thought something has to be done. Um, the time has come for us to engage with our community, but also to highlight the fact that Swimming is no longer, oh, it's not priority, or I, I can do without it, or water safety is no longer, don't go near the water. No, swimming, water safety, and drowning prevention are all tied into one. So if only to get that message across, that's what we're setting to achieve as the BSA. I think another, another thing that um, the film, a film called Black Scan Swim has highlighted is people around the world, um, Black, Asian, and minority ethnics around the world who have felt hitherto that they've not been heard, um, maybe zooming back to the UK, are finally getting it. They're finally thinking, you know, someone's speaking up. There is a voice. Someone, someone gets what I'm going through. But yes, yeah, so we know the issues are there. What's the next step? How do we how do we resolve these issues that have been highlighted? And again, that's where we, as the BSA, come in. So the film is, is 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 getting people to go. Yes, would like to talk about this. Yes, would like to resolve it. And the BSA is working with the aquatic authorities to effect that change within the community, at home and abroad. If you think about the aquatic opportunities that exist within the aquatic community, so from from rookie lifeguards, lifeguarding, swimming, teaching. Here in the UK, you have a lot of people from the non-BAME community, because they've grown up swimming, they tend to take on these roles and use this money, really, the socioeconomic benefits that they get from these roles to pay for university, you know, to buy, you know, essential items. But these are roles that, as a community, we can't partake in the benefits, we can't partake in these opportunities because we don't swim. Our, 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 the teenagers don't swim, or maybe those that do swim are not aware that these jobs are available. Um, and so th there are just lots of doors that are shut because of this particular issue within our community. And it's time to highlight these. It's time to go, we need to change the system. Now, one of the things we've found, the messaging, um, where the messaging is put out, how it is put out, it's not put out in a way that is inclusive for us. Well, thank you, Ed and Danielle, for joining us today. Um, we, For anybody who wants to learn more about the BSA, about Ed's film, or about Danielle's uh, Nemes products, we will have links to those down below, so check those out. Um, and we look forward to checking in with you guys down the road and, and see what other developments you have at the BSA. So thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Hey, do you love swim swim as much as I do? Do you want hours of endless practice footage, race video, and a guide to the best pancakeries in the country? Then subscribe to our YouTube channel below and follow us on social media at swim swim news on Twitter and Instagram. If we get a million followers, I might just eat a million pancakes. Only one way to find out.